Hello. Last week, Lucy Letby was sentenced after having been found guilty of murdering seven babies and of attempting to murder six others. She's the most prolific child killer of modern day Britain. She's become the fourth woman ever in the UK to receive a whole life sentence. And she's received a whole life sentence for every murder and for every attempted murder. So this means she will never get out of prison. You created situations so that collapses or causes of collapses would not be obvious or associated with you. You removed and retained confidential records of events relating to your crimes and checked up on bereaved parents. There was a deep malevolence bordering on sadism in your actions. I'm not sure why the judge said she was bordering on sadism rather than sadistic. I think there's evidence that she is sadistic. In other words, that she did enjoy killing the babies. The evidence was circumstantial, so no one actually saw Lucy Letby killing a baby. But patterns emerged and Lucy Letby was always there when babies were killed or when they suddenly collapsed under suspicious circumstances. There were altogether 25 suspicious situations, but the jury couldn't come to a conclusion about some of them. The details of the killings were, of course, very disturbing. This was an intensive care unit full of little babies, many of whom were premature. The babies suffered extremely painful deaths. So they were um, injected with air or they were overfed with milk. The air was injected into their tummies so they couldn't breathe because it was, um, it was pushing down on their lungs. And they were also, some of them also were given insulin. The prosecution pointed to a relationship Lucy Letby had with a registrar. He was married, he had two children, and supposedly they were just friends. But they spent a lot of time together, they would meet outside of work, they'd message for hours and hours into the night sometimes, and um, and they found that at Lucy Letby's home, she had doodled love um, next to his name and she had sent him heart emojis. And she would ask when he was next working, she would want to see more of him. And on one occasion when she uh, had hurt a baby, a doctor came and she asked if this particular registrar was gonna be coming. So the doctor ended up calling him and she spent the day with him trying to revive this baby. So it meant she spent more time with him because he would often come running when the alarm was, was called for him. And uh, on top of that, even when he wasn't there, she would get his sympathy if she told him that a baby had died or that a baby had nearly died or collapsed. He brought her chocolates once when he thought she was unhappy because of a baby being poorly. He allowed her to use his car to drive herself home on another occasion. So he was very supportive of her and she got a lot of attention from him when things were going badly with the babies. So even though she called this a friendship, it seems it was more than that. And on one occasion in court, the prosecution referred to him as her boyfriend and she appeared to agree. On top of this, the first time she cried was when she heard his voice, when he had to say his name before testifying. She was so distressed that she stood up and had to be taken out of the court to have a break in order to recover. And notably, she didn't cry at any time when any of the babies were talked about. The only times she cried were when that doctor spoke and when photos of her bedroom were shown. The reason the prosecution have been pointing to this relationship is that they've said she murdered the babies for the attention of this doctor because he was often on the scene when the alarm was called. He had no idea of who Lucy Letby was. He actually said to her on one occasion that she was the only person he would trust with his two children. No matter how attracted you are to someone, no matter how much of a connection you have, wanting to spend time with that person is not going to make you want to kill a baby. So there was obviously more to it. She would also get the sympathy of other people on the ward. 
and uh, one of her colleagues believes that this is why she was hurting babies, that it was about how she gets sympathy from people if the baby died and she'd be praised if the baby survived. So both ways she got a lot of attention. Was it that she sought attention so much, you know, that it was so important to her to get that attention, that she was willing to kill babies for it? Or was there something else going on? Beverly Allett was a nurse in her 20s who also killed babies. She was convicted of murdering four children and of attempting to murder another three. She was diagnosed with Munchausen's by proxy. This came after a long history of having had Munchausen's herself. She'd use a bandage when there wasn't a wound underneath it. She would use a cast when she didn't need to. She even managed to have an operation on her appendix when she didn't need to. It takes this kind of thing to be diagnosed with Munchausen's. And she started displaying aggressive behaviour. And this was long before she started killing babies. She even smeared the walls with faeces. That's how desperate she was for attention. Lucy Letby hasn't shown any of these symptoms. No one from her past has ever talked about her doing anything like any of these things. Beverly Allett was killing babies apparently so that she could get attention, so that people would feel sorry for her. She behaved in a way in which she, you know, she was acting as if she was very attached to the babies. She would be seen rocking the dead babies. Uh, but that was actually quite different from Lucy Letby. Lucy Letby wanted to involve herself in what was going on. She would be the one to tell the parents their baby had died. Even when she wasn't supposed to be on that unit, she was supposed to be caring for a different baby on a different unit. And, uh, and she would be there with the parents. She would be making little prints of the baby's feet and hands for the parents. She... Uh, you know, and so on, she'd be sending them cards. So it was clear she wanted to be a part of what was happening. But at the same time, people commented on how she didn't look devastated. So, so that makes me wonder about how much of this was about her trying to get attention, her trying to get pity, you know, and people to feel sorry for her. It seems like if that's what it was about, if that at least was mainly what it was about, then she would have tried harder to come across as more devastated. One of the consultants has mentioned how he held a meeting with the staff about the deaths of babies. You know, other nurses were, he said, traumatized and she looked fine, that it really jumped out at him how when he said to her how this must have hit her hard, two babies in a row when she was on duty and he hoped she was gonna rest over the weekend, how um, she had said, no, she was coming into work the next day and she hadn't looked disturbed or upset at all. And parents have mentioned how she was smiling. She was smiling on one occasion, apparently when the mother was bathing her dead son. If the whole point of killing him had been for attention, then wouldn't she have been putting lots of effort into looking upset in order to have got that attention from the parents? The fact that she was happy when the baby was dead, that suggests to me that it was about a desire to inflict that pain, either on the baby or on the parents or both. Also, she'd killed several babies before she became friends with the registrar. So even if she did get attention from him, that can't have been the reason as to why she was initially killing babies. Were these texts really about trying to get attention? and trying to get people to feel bad for her? Or were they just about trying to make sure no one was suspicious of her? Lucy Letby had photos on her walls of her godchildren and she'd apparently uh, signed a birthday card to herself from her two cats and she'd addressed herself as mummy. So, I mean, that's pretty unusual. It's one thing thinking of a cat as your baby, um, many, pet owners do that including me you know they are our little furry babies but to actually 
go a step further and address a birthday card to yourself as mummy from your two cat children. It's pretty um, bizarre. On top of this, she had written on a post-it note that she would never have children and she would never marry. So if we put these two things together, could it be that she was jealous of these parents that they'd been able to have children and she couldn't and that she killed them out of jealousy? There is something else supporting this, which is her love of this doctor. If she's in love with a married man and if he's got two children, then she's not going to have children with him, presumably. You know, so she could have felt even more like forever she is not going to be able to be a mother. And so it kind of makes sense that she's kind of getting her own back on all these happy couples who are who have kids, you know, all these women who have men willing to commit to them, unlike her. Maybe she did feel like it was never going to happen for her. The first time Lucy Letby murdered a baby was the day after coming home from a hen do. That could be a coincidence or it could be that the hen do really brought up all of this sadness that she wasn't engaged, she wasn't close to being engaged, she wasn't going out with someone who was single even, and one of her nurse friends was about to get married. So maybe her jealousy about that was taken out on the baby. A good friend of Lucy Letby's who has stuck by her and believed her story and still does now that she's been found guilty, you know, she still claims that her friend is innocent. This friend said that the reason Lucy Letby went into nursing was because when she was born, she nearly died and the hospital managed to save her. And so she wanted to care for babies that were in the same position she'd been in. I think that's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, because it makes me think about how she may have been projecting her own self-hatred onto the babies, you know, because she related to them to some degree. I don't think we could say that Lucy Letby nearly dying is the whole reason as to why her parents are so protective of her. But I do think it may be one of the pieces of the puzzle and that it might help to explain that. Her mother shouted out when she was arrested, um, I did it, take me instead. And she was crying, you know, and that's pretty unusual. It's understandable that she would have been upset, but to actually try to claim responsibility for murdering babies, um, it was just weird. You know, obviously the police weren't going to believe her. And whether she did it out of desperation in that moment and genuinely uh, a desire to protect her child, or whether this was some kind of manipulation to pretend to be, you know, trying to save her when everyone knew that wasn't going to happen. I don't know. In court, she was devastated when her daughter was found guilty and she just couldn't believe it. There was something Lucy Letby said about her parents in a text message to a friend and it really jumped out at me. Her friend had asked if she wanted to go with her to New Zealand to work over there. Lucy Letby replied, not brave enough to up and leave everything. I couldn't leave my parents. They would be completely devastated. Find it hard enough being away from me now and it's only a hundred miles. Her parents rented a flat in Manchester so that they could be there throughout the whole trial. And that was quite expensive. If what Lucy Letby says is true and her parents' lives would fall apart if they weren't living close by, uh, that suggests to me that there was enmeshment going on, that Lucy Letby wasn't just close to her parents, but there was something unhealthy in how close they were. So in other words, Lucy Letby would have felt like what she does has a massive effect emotionally on her parents. Letby also said, I came here to uni and didn't go back. They hate it and I feel guilty for staying here sometimes, but it's what I want. She told another friend, my parents worry massively about everything and anything, hate that I live alone, etc. I feel bad because I know it's really hard for them, especially as I'm an only child. 
and they mean well, just a little suffocating at times and constantly feel guilty. Presumably they wanted her to go to university close to where they lived. Maybe they even wanted her to live with them. And then when she finished uni, they wanted her to move back to where they lived. She didn't go out much when she was younger. She was studying so hard at uni and that's pretty unusual for students. So it could be that maybe she didn't want to go out much. Maybe she was just so studious naturally. Or it could be that she felt under pressure that she had to be a good girl, you know, and study hard and that there were certain things that her parents expected of her. I mean, even her living alone was a huge problem for them, that it made them worried sick about her. And why would that be so frightening? Somebody living alone in a perfectly safe part of the country, you know, in her 20s, she's an adult now. So it gives us some idea of how protective her parents were. Letby's parents are described by neighbours as doting on their daughter. They were very proud of her, apparently. They put up a notice in the local paper when she graduated to congratulate her. A covert narcissist would have got a lot of positive attention for some aspects of her behaviour, possibly her personality, but only for some and not enough um, of others. I get the impression that Lucy Letby's parents weren't able to understand her, they couldn't relate to her, they couldn't empathise with her need for freedom, to, to be independent, to live her own life. So if they didn't like her living alone, if that was something they really worried about so much, then what else would they not have been okay with? What other things were there that most people her age wanted to do that she wasn't supposed to do? When she was a teenager, would they have been strict on when she could come home at night, stricter than most parents? Would they have worried about who her friends were? Parents who worry about this can end up encouraging some friendships and discouraging others. She went to church when she was at school and she used to hang out with friends who also went to church every week. Apparently she didn't have a boyfriend through school. Were her parents very religious? Were they perhaps strict about whether she could date? What else in her life was controlled? Would they worry about her health too? Parents who are overly cautious about their child's health can end up being very strict about what they eat. They can take them to the doctor when they don't need to go to the doctor. And they can restrict activities because they think they're going to be bad for them. When you've been controlled all of your life, you can feel a need to control others. Because it's the only way for you to get that control back. When she was arrested, her dad was staying over at her house because he'd driven her home from where they'd had their holiday the day before. I found that interesting, that her mum must have gone home on her own and her dad went all the way to drive Lucy home to her house and it was so far out of the way that he then had to stay over. Lucy Letby was 28 at the time. So she was two years off 30. You know, why couldn't she make it back her own way as an adult? She drove. If her parents are going so far out of their way in order to make sure she is taken home, would, would there be an underlying message that she isn't really capable, that she can't be independent because there's something wrong with her? Even though obviously that's not what they would have intended to put across to her, we pick up these messages as we grow up. It makes me think of someone who who was always being trapped in some way. After many years of this, it can make someone feel angry because they they almost have to play along. You know, they have to be this incapable sort of helpless person who's reliant on that parent because that's what the parent is comfortable with. And they can end up internalising the, the, the message that they picked up on. So Lucy Letby could have ended up thinking, I am helpless. I can't function on my own. I'm incapable. For people to be close to me, I have to give up a lot of myself. After she was arrested for the first time, Lucy Letby sold her home in 2019 and she moved in with her parents. 
it's been reported that Lucy Letby's parents are up and leaving their house that they've lived in for at least 33 years and they're going to move 250 miles away so that they can be near to where she's in prison. According to one of her neighbours, she's barely seen them since Lucy Letby was first arrested. So apparently they've been hiding out at the back of the house and they haven't been picking up the phone. She said Lucy Letby is their whole world. Maybe it's understandable that they've been hiding from the neighbours. I mean, we don't know what the neighbours are like. This neighbour has said she feels so bad for them, but who knows? She might be a very gossipy person. I mean, she is talking to the papers about them. <laughs> So maybe it's understandable that they were hiding away, but at the same time, if that's true and their daughter is their whole world, then you, you can have an idea of how much that means they need from her, how much pressure there would have been on Lucy Letby all of her life. When she talks about feeling guilty, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if she really would have felt guilt or so some people mix up guilt with shame so it could be that she would feel shame around them one of the things she wrote on this post-it note was that she felt um she didn't deserve her parents and uh, and that could be something that someone would say you know having murdered babies and that's why she's saying it it could well be that but i get the feeling that anyway she never was who they've decided she was, you know, and that when she's saying she didn't deserve her parents, that that is something that she would have felt before she killed a baby. She could be left believing she's a bad person because she's fooled her parents for all of these years. She's had to lie to them to keep them happy because they expect unreasonable things of her. Even if she doesn't consciously feel anger towards them, she's grown up believing she has to be an angel and ignore her own feelings and desires. So she could feel anger towards the world for always demanding so much of her. She could believe she has no choice but to wear a mask to keep up with everyone's demands. I think it's telling that her neighbour described her as having always been a good girl. She lived next door to her since she was born and children aren't always good, you know. So, I mean, it could be that the neighbour was being generous or it could be that Lucy Letby always felt like she had to be very good, almost very grown up for, for a little girl. And that again makes me think of someone who was taught that other people's feelings must come first. What you do with that as you grow up is you either decide that that's true and you beat yourself up all the time and you do put other people first or you realise it's impossible and you resent people for expecting it of you in the first place because you're aware, you know, you're more aware. You understand that it's not fair. So you have anger inside you and but you also know that you have to go along with what they want. And so you pretend to put their needs first if you're a covert narcissist, you know, you, that's how you, you kind of just manipulate everyone and you pretend you're someone you're not. I've talked in previous videos about covert narcissism and what makes someone a covert narcissist, how when you're a child, you need to look out for a parent, you need to be a parent to them. And so that gives you a feeling that you're not allowed to have your own needs, which creates resentment and rage inside of you and also a feeling of power, that you have this power since you're a child over an adult because they're so needy of you. Some people at the hospital where she worked describe Lucy Letby as being superior and um, they say that they found her cold. And I think that both of those things would make sense if in her childhood she had so much power over her parents. She apparently wouldn't hesitate to tell a nurse who was senior to her or even a doctor that they were doing something wrong. 
she was apparently obsessed with rules and getting everything right. And, and of course, this can't have been down to dedication to her patients. It must have been about her ego, you know, about believing that she knew everything and she knew exactly how to do everything right and needing to show that off and put other people down. I think one of her motives in killing the babies was to hurt the parents. And, and I say that because of how much she wanted to be involved in telling them, you know, and because she was looking them up so many times on social media, she'd look them up at Christmas times, at anniversaries of the baby's death. So it seems that she really wanted to know that they were still reacting to the baby's death. Just looking at her handwriting in one of the cards she sent a parent, the way the, the, the big capital at the beginning, you know, when you have a, a, a really, you know, giant capital letter compared to the smaller letters, it's supposed to suggest arrogance. If you look at that, and then if you look at the way she writes Lucy, it really seems um, like she's reveling in writing this card. You know, that's the impression I get. Obviously, I'm, I'm biased because I've heard about how she was looking up the parents all of these times as well and how she'd taken a photo of this card on her phone. But there's still something about how she signs Lucy, you know, in this extravagant way as if this is about her when really it's about the death of their child. She had to be asked several times to stop going into the family room where parents were spending time with their dying son. And she wasn't even supposed to be on that unit at that time either. But she just couldn't stop being there and watching these parents with their son. As I walked towards uh, the incubator, I could see on the monitors that the oxygen saturations, which is basically the baby's oxygen levels, were dropping. And they dropped to a level that um, ordinarily, number one, the alarms would have been going off. But number two, the nurse would have called for help. And Lucy Lepley was standing by the top of the incubator. She didn't have her hands in the incubator. What uh, was she doing then? Well, she, just, she was just standing there. Now, tubes become dislodged. But this was a 25-week gestation baby um, who wasn't kicking around, who wasn't vigorous. The only possibility was that that tube had to have been dislodged deliberately. There have been studies done looking at why it is that people who go on to murder their patients entered the medical profession in the first place. One theory is that they go into the profession with the intention of murdering patients. And another theory is that that's not their intention. They go into the profession for other reasons and then they end up becoming a murderer. I think for Lucy Letby, it was the latter. I think she wanted to go into nursing from a very young age because that was who she thought she was. That's how her parents saw her. That's how everybody saw her because that was what her mask was. And uh, she, although she would have known, I'm not really being myself with these people. I don't think she would have thought of it consciously as this is not who I am and I'm going to pretend to be this person. But I think that she would have been attracted to the profession that aligned with her identity and her identity was all about giving to others and being very caring. Lucy Letby was known as Mary Poppins by her friends because she always had plasters, um, antiseptic wipes in case someone grazed themselves and spare tampons for her friends. So it seems that she was very comfortable in the role of being the helper, rescuing her friends and um, being thought of as a very kind and thoughtful person. She was a kind of motherly figure. Every time she was rescuing her friends, she may have felt a sense of control. Covert narcissists get close to people when they perceive those people as being vulnerable and they act as if they're the rescuer, as if they're there to save you and um, support you. In reality, they target vulnerability because it's vulnerability that enables them to feel powerful. And when they're around people who they can control, then they're in their element. And it seems that Lucy Letby was in her element when she was at work. There she was on a unit with the weakest, most vulnerable people there are, you know, 
premature babies and you know and and sick premature babies so she couldn't have been more in control than she was in her role at work and apparently her whole life revolved around work even when she wasn't at work she would have been able to tell you which nurse was in charge of which baby according to one of her colleagues the friend who has remained faithful to believing in Lucy Letby's side and, and thinking that she's innocent has described spending time with Lucy Letby as feeling joyful and peaceful. She said that was the kind of aura Lucy Letby had. And I found that really interesting as well, because when you feel joy, you don't have anything holding you down. You know, when you feel peaceful, you feel very calm, like there's no threat around you. And a covert narcissist can have that impact on people. You know, not all of them. There are some covert narcissists who, when you're around them, you can feel that something is off. You know, even if they're acting like nice people, you can still feel like um, they're toxic. There are some covert narcissists who I think are very, very good at coming across in a way that really doesn't, you know, even if you're very perceptive of these things, and I like to think I am, um, they can still not show any kind of toxicity. They can, they can really come across as um, very harmless. And, uh, and I think that Lucy Letby was one of these people because of the number of people who were so sure that she was innocent and, and, and the lengths they went to, you know, her manager, for example, put her reputation at risk, saying that she was willing to be held responsible if another baby died, which it did, you know, because she let Lucy Letby come to work when these four paediatricians were begging her not to. One of those raising concerns at the hospital was Dr John Gibbs. We paediatricians were certainly concerned that someone, and suspicion fell on Lucy Letby, could have been harming and perhaps killing patients on the unit. If they just listened to us hospital paediatricians, I think the police would have been called in a lot earlier. These covert narcissists who you don't suspect, you know, the ones who really come across very well. The best way I could describe the feeling that you can have around them, you know, from my own experience, is it feels like you're on holiday. It kind of feels like, you know, everything is being lifted up for you. You don't have to do anything, as if you're staying in a really luxurious resort, you know, where as soon as you arrive, someone grabs your suitcase and there's just this sense of feeling like you're being carried, you know, and, um, and that is a very peaceful feeling. It's a very calm, gentle experience. And it does make you feel joy if you're the kind of person who tends to have a lot of responsibilities. And especially if you're someone who can feel responsible for others because they're so um, perceptive and they're, they're, it's almost like they're waiting on you hand and foot. They're kind of, they're ready and willing to help, you know, and to be there for you. And I think that that is how Lucy Letby came across. It's love bombing and it's also very controlling because that what that perceptive nature, you know, that allows a covert narcissist who's that successful as Lucy Letby has been um, to do what they do. If you use that perception to manipulate people, then it's kind of like it makes me think of an octopus. It's kind of like that their, their hands get into everything, you know, or it's like you can't escape they they're aware of everything they need to know everything about you they're they're ready you know they um they know exactly how you tick and they know exactly how to treat you to get what they want from you and this is also in line with a sociopath you know a sociopath is not a diagnostic term but it's a term that we all know and use you know a sociopath is somebody who um, I mean, they might have antisocial personality disorder. That's the diagnostic term. But a sociopath is somebody who 
uh, wants to know everything about you when they first meet you because they want to have this information on you that they can use at a later time. A couple who had a premature baby have talked about how Lucy Letby was there for the birth and seemed very supportive, kind and caring. She would tell them repeatedly that he was her favourite baby. And another nurse apparently said that she had been really annoyed when this nurse had taken over his care one night. And this other nurse couldn't believe how annoyed Lucy Letby was. She'd apparently asked four or five times for her to swap so that Lucy Letby could look after that baby. Apparently she and the parents chatted for hours. She would open up to them about her parents, about her friends, and going out and so on. So the mother actually thought they were friends. Bearing in mind what we know about Lucy Letby, all of this comes across to me as love bombing. She was taking them into her confidence. She was, she wanted them to view her as this really lovely person. And it seems she was feeding off that, that this was her narcissistic supply. If you think about it in the neonatal unit, there would be so many emotions from parents. You know, when their child is poorly, the, the, the parents are gonna be really upset and stressed. And when the child's doing well, they're gonna be so relieved. And I think of Lucy Letby as like a puppeteer who was manipulating the emotions of the parents and enjoying that power and control she had. And the father suggested to his wife that Lucy Letby should be the godmother of their son. After love bombing these parents and making them feel really secure with her, she then told them one day that the baby had blood in his nappy. So I think she was reveling in all of the attention she got when she was love bombing them. And then the, the panic that they must have been feeling about the blood and how they then became more needy of her. You know, they needed her to be their heroine to make sure that the baby was fine. So they were more reliant on her and she had more control over them. With hindsight, the father has said that the baby always had dips when Lucy Letby was looking after them. And then she seemed to be the heroine rescuing him each time, you know, and helping him to recover. And so they were always so grateful to her. So again, it's that rescuing persona coming out, you know, and all of the narcissistic supply around that. She gave this mother a Mother's Day card that was handmade. The couple had assumed she must have given this to every parent, but she didn't, it was just them. And she took a photo of the baby and he doesn't have oxygen attached to him. And they questioned that because he was on 24 hour oxygen. And Lucy Letby said that she thought they would appreciate a photo of him without that. And that she had been cleaning his oxygen tubes at the time. The parents have since learned that you can't ever remove oxygen from a baby who needs it 24 seven. And this is probably the most creepy of everything I've heard about Lucy Letby because this baby is struggling for air, you know, is suffocating when she's taken this photo for the parents. It's so disturbing. The fact that this photo is put into a homemade card, it makes me think of how she was so devious and she seemed to really get off on getting away with things. You know, this is what makes me think of her as sadistic because they got this card, they felt uneasy and that's why they asked this question about the oxygen supply. But at the same time, it was a homemade card. So I think she felt that she was in a position where she could make them feel uncomfortable and uneasy and worried, but they wouldn't be able to be angry with her or to tell her off or anything because this was a homemade card. So it feels especially manipulative and cruel. It, it, it shows how this wasn't just a lack of empathy and killing the babies wasn't just about trying to get attention. There seems to have been something about torturing, you know, and um, something deeply malicious about wanting to torture and getting 
uh, a good feeling from putting people through pain, both the babies and the, and the parents. Dr. Sandy Bowen is a neonatologist and consultant paediatrician who was called as an expert witness in the trial. And she said that it's almost unheard of for a premature baby to scream, that they can cry briefly when they're having an injection, when they're having blood taken, but they don't scream. And some of these babies that Lucy murdered or harmed were screaming for half an hour. And she said that showed what extreme pain they were in. So again, it wasn't just about wanting the babies dead, it was about wanting them to suffer. She asked us to change a nappy and we'd said to her, oh, we're very scared about changing nappies because we were first time parents. So can you show us how to change a nappy because my kids are very small and tiny. And at the time, her body language and her behaviour totally changed. I told my husband that she took the blood from baby L's foot many times. So when was this? When were you having that conversation with her? After the incident happened. I think she was unsuccessful with killing my kids. That's why she was very annoyed with us. She thought that I couldn't kill your baby. So you're saying that she seemed more aggressive after they had recovered. And do you think that's because she was frustrated? Yes. Feeling angry with the parents that she couldn't kill their baby, it suggests that she's very tied up in needing them to react emotionally. This was about a desire to punish. If your baby is in a neonatal unit, very premature, possibly unwell, then you might come across as if you don't trust anyone who's looking after them because you're so worried all the time. So you might, uh, you might keep going in and looking at them or you might keep asking if they're okay. And maybe that triggered something in her in the way that her parents were suffocating, in the way that they behaved as if they didn't see her as capable because of all of their worries about her all the time. And there were more suffocating parents at work every time she went in, you know, desperately inquiring about their babies, not having slept, you know, their whole lives revolving around them. Could it be that this reminded her of her parents? And um, whether that was consciously or unconsciously, it just made her angry. But it could also be that mixed in with this was something very different from what she'd experienced with her parents. It could be that she perceived the love coming from these parents at work as being genuine, that, that they uh, adored their babies in a very um, unconditional way, whereas her own parents had loved her in a way that may have felt very conditional because they were so needy of her. So it could be that she was jealous of the way these parents were with their babies. And it could be that she was jealous of the babies. Their very vulnerability that drew in all of this care and attention would have made her very angry. She had to work all the time for, to earn the love she got from her parents. You know, she had to be this perfect person at all times. She had to be constantly a Mary Poppins with her friends to keep them interested. She had to try so hard and care so much, or rather behave as if she did, you know, and, and it must have been quite exhausting. It would have made the baby seem so powerful and would have made her feel powerless around it. it would have made her feel really inadequate and worthless. All she had to get love from people was a mask. It was a fake self. These babies that didn't have to do anything, they just had to exist and they were loved and adored and they had so much attention and everyone was running around them trying to make sure they were okay. Even amongst parents who praised her, their babies still would have got more positive attention than her. Maybe just being around these parents at work was reminding her of how her own parents were. Hello, Lucy, is it? Yes. Hello, my name is Chester, please. Look, okay, step in two seconds. Oh, uh, yes? Yeah, thank you. Even when we see her walking towards the camera, there's something about the way she looks, the way she kind of looks down. It almost feels like she's planning as she walks, you know, planning on what her expression's going to be, on how she's going to come across. It just feels like everything is 
calculated, you know, and I think she was a very calculating person, as the judge said himself. Just take a seat in there for me, Lucy. I'll move that seat forward a bit. Sure. Yeah, I just had knee surgery. So. Oh, right, okay. She was very good at manipulating people into thinking that the deaths were bad luck. When her colleagues would question it, she would keep diverting them back to the idea that this was just bad luck. I think she has a very high emotional intelligence and she's very good at, um, at knowing exactly at what point to manipulate a situation and in what way. She's very, very subtle. She would have been born with some of these abilities, you know, but I think on top of that, she has been honing them for many years because she's needed to understand her parents from an early age. If you have parents who um, are independent, are responsible for themselves and able to really concentrate on their child and give them what they need, then the child doesn't have to be that perceptive. They can just get on with being a kid. But when a child senses that the parents need something from them, it means that they have to become more aware of what that parent needs at any given time. And my feeling is that this is what Lucy Letby experienced with her parents. And in turn, I think that's what brings up the hate. She says she hates herself and I believe her. Why would she lie about that? And I think the rage she felt towards the babies to want to kill them came from that hate inside her. She projected her own self-hatred onto the babies. I'll never have children or marry, no hope. And then despair, panic, fear, lost, so she's getting all her feelings off her chest. This is her being honest. Finally, the mask is off. She can be herself. She's alone at home. She doesn't think anyone's ever going to read this. A forensic psychiatrist commented on this, and he said that he thought Lucy Letby was experiencing guilt. I don't see it that way at all. I think this is shame. And there's a big difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is when you feel for the person you think you've hurt, or you know you've hurt in Lucy Letby's case, and shame is about hating yourself. I think all of these things she's saying about how she's evil, about how she doesn't deserve her parents and all of this is about shame. It's about thinking that this is how others will perceive her that there's something wrong with her, there's something that can't be fixed about her, you know, there's something very dysfunctional, there's something disgusting about her, but it's not, it's not, I don't think this is her thinking about the poor babies and thinking about their poor parents. It's just about her. I did this. I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough to care for them. So she said it herself. This is the reason why she's killed them. She sees the babies as better than her. She's not at their level where she can look after them. She's too bad a person and they're too good for her. And that's important because I think it means she's jealous of them, partly because they bring up in her this reminder that she's a bad person, that she's a fake. She knows babies are innocent and pure. They've never done anything wrong. They don't have bad intentions. And she knows that other women feel very protective towards them, that other women feel like they want to hold them and cuddle them. They feel warmth towards them. And she doesn't. She doesn't have that empathy. So being around these pure, loved babies is going to highlight in her how much she doesn't feel this love, how cold she is how fake she is. It's going to be a constant reminder that her mask is a mask, that everything people love about her is fake. So if you think about that in terms of how a narcissist operates, that the mask of the narcissist is how they get their sense of self-esteem. That's how they get their narcissistic supply, that they feel like they're no one without their mask. The mask is what makes them feel like a somebody. So if you take that mask away, they're left feeling like a nobody. During the course of this trial, 
you have coldly denied any responsibility for your wrongdoing and sought to attribute some fault to others. You have no remorse. There are no mitigating factors. In their totality, the offences of murder and attempted murder were of exceptionally high seriousness and just punishment, according to law, requires a whole life order. Lucy Letby, on each of the seven offences of murder and the seven offences of attempted murder, I sentence you to imprisonment for life. Because the seriousness of your offences is exceptionally high, I direct that the early release provisions do not apply. The order of the court, therefore, is a whole life order on each and every offence, and you will spend the rest of your life in prison. So I hope that was helpful. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. I'm now in the middle of the courses I'm running on healing from narcissistic abuse and I'm going to be planning the next one soon. So if you're interested, please get in touch. Send me an email to contact at liveabusefree.com. And Billy says hello. Don't you, darling? Hmm? Yes, I thought so. <laughs> you just told yourself you were going to move, didn't you? And then you moved. But you had to tell yourself out loud, didn't you? Um, she would tell them repeatedly that... No, darling. <laughs> Not just me. Not just me. Nice and quiet. She would tell them repeatedly. <laughs> Darling, <laughs> you are such a naughty nozzle. Oh. Mm. The first time the first time Lucy let be murdered a baby was the day after come Darling, honestly, you do this as soon as I start talking, don't you? Just let me say this sentence, okay? While I've been editing this video, I've noticed that throughout it, I've got stains on my lips. <laughs> um, so I think I'm going to have to talk about this powder I eat again <laughs> and do another kind of advert for it. It has a very low sugar content and it has tons of nutrients in it.